It's been an interesting year, Amen. to say the least. It's been an interesting season. And uh, I want to talk about seasons tonight. You know, after what we have uh, faced so far in 2020, uh, I've been meditating on some things and I've been watching what's going on in our society today and what's going on in the news and what's going on around our country. And <clears throat> I've recently come to a stark realization that has just become more real to me than it ever was before. I mean, I knew this, I knew the time was coming, but uh, I believe we are closer than ever to a, a time where the body of Christ is coming to a crossroads. We're, we're coming to a, a, a place where uh, in our society, the dark is getting darker. The chaos is getting more chaotic. The enemy has become more emboldened than I have ever seen. There's stuff going on in our society today that I would never have imagined that I would see in our nation. And uh, I believe that Christians need to discern the seasons that we are living in. And that's what I want to talk about tonight is discerning seasons. <clears throat> we are coming to a place, I believe, where Christians are going to have to take a stand or if we don't, for the first time in our lives, I believe we are actually in a legitimate danger of losing some of our religious freedoms. I, I've never seen anything like this before. Right now, there are state and local governments in our country right now, in the greatest country in the world, in the most free society in the world. There are, there are governments in our country right now that are forcing churches to close their doors. And they're doing it in the name of safety. They're doing it in the name of, uh, <clears throat> you know, we, we need to uh, flatten the curve, they're saying. But they're forgetting that we have a constitutional right to assemble. We have a constitutional freedom of worship. And, uh, you know, we, we had a church here in Florida a couple of months ago that uh, the pastor got arrested for having church. And people say, well, the whole situation ended up okay. You know, they released him and they didn't fine him. They, they didn't charge him with anything. Well, yeah, that is good from that perspective. But their church did lose their insurance policy over this. There, there, there's an oppression going on against Christianity right now. We have other governments who are not demanding that churches close, but they are politely asking that churches close. We have governments in our country right now that are telling people that it's illegal to sing in church. This is, this is real. You can go to church, but you can't sing. We have government offices that are being overrun by lawless people. City Hall being taken over. And while it happens, the, po the politicians are praising and applauding the zeal of the people that are breaking the law. We're slowly watching people begin to relinquish their freedoms. And it's alarming. And I don't want anyone who's listening to make any mistake about this, anybody in this room, anybody who's watching online right now, make no mistake, the body of Christ is a target. Amen. Christianity is a target. The church of the living God is a target in all of this. So my question tonight is, do you want to stand for what's right? Or are you going to cower back and allow godless people to dictate to you how you're going to live? Are we going to raise our voice against the enemy's agenda? Yes. Or are we going to just sit back and watch our society drift further and further and further away from godliness? I have a friend in uh, Ohio. She used to be one of the singers on my praise team when I was a worship leader up there. And her husband played guitar for me uh, when I was up in uh, Ohio. This, I, I left Ohio 16 years ago. But this, uh, this woman is a very godly woman. She is a mother of six boys, uh, a godly mother, godly uh, uh, wife, a Proverbs 31 woman, spirit-filled Christian, godly woman. 
She loves the Lord. She raises her family according to scriptural principles. She manages her affairs well. She is a, a, a very godly woman, and she's also very, very much an American patriot. She loves living in this country. This is the greatest country in the world. She loves living in, the, in this country, and she's very vocal about her beliefs. She's very vocal about her faith. She's very vocal about how she feels about uh, this country and our freedoms. And she uh, posted on Facebook a couple of weeks ago. She went to a gas station, and she was going in there to buy a bag of ice. And when she came back out to her car, uh, there was a, a very large lady standing next to her car. And she thought, well, that's kind of weird that this lady's standing by my car. And she, she went to get into her car. She took her key fob. She unlocked the door. She got into her car. And then the large lady jumped into the back door, the back seat of the car. And she began to remove my friend's car seat. She had a little child's car seat in the back seat. And she turned around and she goes, what are you doing? She goes, you are a racist bigot. She says, what are you doing? She goes, I'm removing your car seat. Now the reason that she was removing the car seat is because she had a Paw Patrol car seat. Does anybody know what Paw Patrol is? Paw Patrol is a cartoon, and the characters in this cartoon, they're all dogs. That's why it's Paw Patrol, P-A-W. But the main character in Paw Patrol is a police dog. And we've got all of this garbage going on right now about defunding the police, and, uh, you know, we, they, they want to get rid of the police entirely. They're just calling for lawlessness and chaos. And because my friend had a Paw Patrol car seat, this lady was going to rip this car seat out of her car and take it with her. Well, she wasn't going to put up with that. So she got out of her car and she grabbed this woman who was a lot bigger than she is. My friend is smaller than Jessica. She, she, she's not a big girl. And she wrestled with this woman and threw her down on the ground and held her there until the cops got there. <clears throat> Now, when the police arrived, the police pulled my friend aside and they go, you're a little pistol. <laughs> he said, I, I don't know if I could have thrown this woman down on the ground. But uh, I have some other friends who are mutual friends with this girl. And we were talking about this situation the other day. And my friend said, uh, she reacted wrongly in that situation. And I said, well, what do you mean? She said, well, she should have turned the other cheek. Well, let me tell you something. We're going to talk about this tonight. We're going to dig into the word and look at that scripture. Jesus did tell us to, other, to, to turn the other cheek. Jesus did not tell us to be a punching bag. Jesus did not tell you to be a welcome mat for people to walk all over you and wipe their dirty boots on you. So we're going to talk about that. Luke chapter 22, verse 35. And again, we're talking about discerning the seasons. Jesus, uh, this is late in Jesus' ministry. This is not too long before Jesus is going to go to the cross. And he's talking with the disciples and he says this. Jesus asked the disciples, when I sent you without a purse, without a bag, without sandals, did you lack anything? What was their answer? They lacked nothing. Now what Jesus is referring to is uh, I believe it's Luke chapter 10 when Jesus sent out 72 disciples. Anybody remember that story? He sent out 72 disciples and he, he sent them out two by two. And he told them, he says, I don't want you to take a money purse. I don't want you to take a bag. I don't want you to take any sandals. You're going to go out and you're going to minister. You're going to teach the kingdom and you're going to heal the sick. By the way, that's what Jesus always did. He taught the kingdom, he healed the sick. He told the 12 disciples, teach the kingdom and heal the sick. He told the 72 disciples, teach the kingdom and heal the sick. And when you do this, I don't want you to take anything with you because you're going to rely on your faith for provision. He says, if anybody invites you into their house to stay, go in and stay with them. 
If anybody gives you any food, eat what's put in front of you. Allow God to provide for you through people that are willing to support your ministry. But don't trust in your purse. Don't trust in your bag. Don't trust in your equipment, your possessions. Trust in the Lord. I'm sending you out to minister. And I want you to put all of your trust in God. And you won't lack anything. Did they lack anything? No. no. He said, when I sent you out without a purse, a bag, or sandals, did you lack anything? They lacked nothing. As a result of their obedience to God's word, they were provided for. As a result of obeying what God told them to do, they lacked nothing. As a result of relying on their faith, rather than relying on things of the natural, they were provided for. They lacked nothing. Can you say amen? Amen. However, Jesus says something really interesting in the next verse. Verse 36. Jesus said to, to the disciples, but now, everyone say, but now. In other words, something has changed. There's a different situation now than what we had before. But now, if you have a money purse, take it. And also a bag. And if you don't have a sword, sell your cloak and go buy one. It is written, verse 37, Jesus is quoting Isaiah here. It is written, and he was numbered with the transgressors. And I tell you that this must be fulfilled in me. So Jesus is saying, Isaiah said in a prophecy 700 years prior to this, in Isaiah 53, that Jesus was going to be counted among transgressors. He was going to be numbered with criminals. He was going to be numbered with sinners, even though he wasn't a sinner. Even though Jesus was perfect, he never, he never sinned. He was numbered with transgressors, and I tell you, this must be fulfilled in me. Yes, what is written about me is reaching its fulfillment. Jesus knew that his ministry was about to come to an end, and he was going to be going to the cross soon. What was written about me is, is reaching its fulfillment. Verse 38, the disciples said, See, Lord, here are two swords. That's enough, he replied. So what Jesus is saying here in this, in this passage, he's saying, we are coming into a different season. I'm going to be arrested soon. I'm going to be counted along with transgressors and criminals. That prophecy is going to be fulfilled. Understand, you're going to need money, and you're also going to need a means to defend yourself if necessary. He's saying things are about to get volatile. So far, we've had a pretty peaceful ministry, but things are about to get vo volatile. And Jesus took the time to explain to them, you probably need, probably need to go buy a sword if you don't have one so that you can take care of yourself. Not that you're going to go out and look for trouble, but that you're going to have a way to defend yourself. You cannot fulfill your kingdom purpose if you're dead. The only person who could fulfill their kingdom purpose by dying was Jesus. You need to be able to defend yourself, to defend your family, to defend your possessions, to, to, to defend the kingdom. Amen. Now, even though Jesus himself was telling them that they ought to buy a sword, he also says something very interesting in this verse. The, the disciples came up, they said, see, Lord, here are two swords. And he said, that's enough. Now, I've read this verse many, many times in my lifetime. I've seen this uh, passage before. And every time that I read it, what I thought Jesus was saying is, two swords are enough. Isn't that what that kind of looks like he's saying? Here we have two swords. That's enough. That's not really what he's saying. If you look in some other translations, about five or six different translations, what Jesus is saying is, that's enough talking about that. Here, Lord, we have two swords. Okay, that's good. That's enough talking about that. Let's not talk about swords. That's what Jesus is saying. So what Jesus is saying is, you need to have a way to defend yourself, but don't dwell on that. Okay, it's good that you have two swords. It's good that you have a way to defend yourself. It's good that you have a way to take care of yourself, but don't trust in that. So... Yeah, that's good. That's enough. Let's not talk about that anymore. Let's go on to spiritual things. That's what Jesus is saying. Psalm chapter 20, 
Verse 7 says this. Some trust in chariots. And some trust in horses. But we trust in the name of the Lord our God. It's quiet in here. We trust in the name of the Lord our God. We don't trust in things. We trust in the Lord. Believers don't trust and put their faith in the things of the natural. We put our trust and our belief in the supernatural provision and protection of our God. Amen? Amen. Now, even though we don't put our faith in natural things, even Jesus said, why don't you go ahead and buy something to protect yourself? There's a balance here. Amen? Then when the disciples said, Lord, we have two swords, Jesus said, okay, that's enough of that. Let's go on. The real point that I want to get to in this passage that we just looked at is that Jesus told his disciples in one place, I'm going to send you out. Don't take a money bag. Don't take a bag. Don't take sandals. Don't take anything with you. And now Jesus is saying, I'm going to send you out, but make sure you have a money bag. Make sure you have equipment and make sure that you have something to defend yourself. Jesus discerned a change in seasons. That's what I'm saying here. Folks, we are in a change of seasons. We came into 2020 with so much momentum and so much excitement about what this, this year had to offer. We had a, a vision casting service at the beginning of this year talking about all the things that we were planning on uh, accomplishing this year. And we were able to accomplish some of those things before COVID started shutting everything down. But even as a nation, we came into 2020 with a strong economy. We came into 2020 uh, with less dependence on foreign energy than we've ever had before. We came into 2020 with some of the lowest uh, unemployment rates that we've ever seen, especially minority unemployment. 2020, we, we started this thing off strong. And then COVID threw everybody f for a loop even the body of Christ. And because of that, now we need to make some adjustments. You know, we, we began to see all of these peaceful protests that started off peaceful but didn't stay peaceful for very long. And they turned into looting and rioting and burning buildings down and tearing down statues and defacing government property and overthrowing City Hall and all the other chaos that's going on. And then I, I read online one day, uh, a few weeks back, I'm sitting in my office and I'm reading some news on my computer and I saw that some peaceful protests were coming to Naples. And we already know it's been proven that a lot of these protests are being held by people that are not from that community. They bring people in from outside communities just to stir up a bunch of dissension. And I'm sitting there in my computer and I'm like, you know, I don't anticipate anything really bad happening to me. But it did remind me that the last time that I went to the gun range, I didn't reload my pistols. So I went and took care of that. I'm not looking for trouble, but I'm not stupid either. I'm prepared, I'm prepared to defend my house and my family. And thank God that we have a provision in our constitution that gives us that right. Now, as I said before, make no mistake about it, what we are facing in our society today is an attack on the body of Christ. It's an attack on the church. Now, people say, well, it's not just attacking the body of Christ, it's, it's attacking everybody. Well, maybe it is, but the church is taking a big brunt of the, the hit of what's going on right now. Hebrews chapter 10 says this. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24. Paul says this. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. I love this verse. Let us consider how we can spur each other on. How we can encourage each other. How we can lift each other up. Anybody ever seen, you know, a spur on a cowboy's boot? What, what is that thing there for? It's so you can kind of dig it into the side of the horse a little bit and make him move faster. It encourages him to work harder. We need to be encouraging each other 
to go on, to go faster, to go stronger, to go harder, to not give up. Amen? Amen. Let us consider. Let us come up with creative ways to spur one another on. To encourage each other. Let us, let us consider this. Let, let us take some time to sit down and put some mental energy towards this. How are we going to encourage each other? How are we going to not let each other fall back but keep marching forward? Now how do we do this? Well he tells us in the very next verse. Verse 25. Not giving up meeting together. As some are in the habit of doing. Pay attention to that word habit. Some are in the habit of not meeting together. We're going to talk about that here in a second. Not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. And all the more as you see the day approaching. We are getting closer and closer and closer to the return of Christ. And we need to be encouraging other, each other all the more as we see the day approaching. We need to be fellowshipping with each other all the more as we see the day approaching. We need to be studying the word of God all the more as we see the day approaching. We need to be praying. We need to be worshiping. We need to be connecting. We need to be reaching out. We need to be sharing our faith. We need to be coming to church and doing all of these things all the more as we see the day approaching. Amen. 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 Paul is saying that we should be connecting with, with each other more and more and more and more the closer we get to the coming of Christ. And what have we seen this year? We have been connecting with each other less and less and less because of this garbage that's going on in our society right now. Folks, our society is messed up. We need to come together. We need to worship together. We need to pray together. We need to break God's word together. We need to fellowship with each other. We need to spur each other on. There's three churches that meet in this building. Our church is the only one of those three that meets twice a week. You know why we meet twice a week? Because we need to meet all the more as we see the day approaching. Amen? Amen. I, I, I'm going to be totally honest with you. Can I just shoot straight with you? Yes. I had considered in the last few months, I had considered doing away with our Wednesday night service. And the reason I had considered it is because not as many show up for our Wednesday night as show up for our Saturday. And I figured, well, you know, if we're not getting a big turnout on Wednesday, well, then why are we putting so much effort towards this? Maybe it's wasted effort. But then I read this this week. We need to be meeting all the more as we see the day approaching. I'm not taking steps backwards. Amen? Amen. Now, I realize that there are people that are watching us online right now. And there are people that don't feel comfortable about coming to church right now. I totally get that. There's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. I'm not criticizing people for not coming to church. We have a, a pretty light crowd tonight. I understand that. But I'm saying that at the very least, if you can't come to church, stay connected online. Stay plugged in to what's going on in the house. Read your emails. Follow us online. Follow us on social media. Find out what's going on in the church. Find out what we're doing and be a part of what's going on. And do it all the more as you see the day approaching. We can't afford to let go of our profession of faith. We can't afford to disconnect with each other. I had a conversation with the leadership of Restoration Church this last week, week and a half or so. Because, you know, we had to close our doors for two months because of COVID. And then we opened back up. And we were open for, I don't know, two weeks. And then uh, we found out that there was a couple that tested positive for COVID and so the pastor of Restoration said, we need to close the building because we need to go through and sterilize everything and make sure that we're safe. And so we did that. We closed the building for a couple of weeks and then we reopened again. And then we were open for a week or two. And then there was another uh, couple of people in one of the other churches that tested positive for COVID. And so they said, we're going to close the building again for two weeks. 
and sterilize the building and wash everything down. And finally, I had to tell them, I said, look, my, my wife and I both, we, we, we communicated with them and we said, look, if we close the doors every time somebody tests positive for COVID, we're never going to reopen again. There are people testing positive all over the place. I understand if people don't feel comfortable coming to church, but that's their choice. We still need to be open for people. We still need to give people a chance to come together and worship together, and all the more as we see the day approaching. We can't allow this situation to dictate to us how we are going to respond to a commandment in God's word. And so we had dinner with them the other night, and Pastor Dom, he spoke with me. He said, you know what? You're the pastor of your church. I can't pastor your church. I shouldn't be making the decision for your church. Amen. If we decide to close, that should make no bearing on whether or not you stay open. If you guys want to stay open, that's totally up to you. And I said, well, praise God for that. Amen. So we don't have to worry about that anymore. Yeah. Amen. Amen. And don't get me wrong, I understand their perspective. I understand that as out, of, out of an abundance of caution, they don't want people to get sick. I don't want people to get sick either. But I can't allow fear to shut me down every time something bad happens. Amen. 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 You want to know what my biggest concern is? This verse says, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. How long does it take to establish a habit? Seven days. Some people say 14, some people say seven. I've heard studies that say 21 days. I've heard some studies that say four to five weeks. But somewhere in the one to five week category is how long it takes to establish a habit. So I'm going to go in the middle. I'll just say three weeks. That sound reasonable to everybody? It takes three weeks to establish a habit. If you want to quit smoking, then go 21 days without smoking. And by the time you get to the 21st day, you've probably got this thing licked. Or really close to it anyway. You know? If, if you want to establish a habit, if you want to, if you want to get up early, you, you know, maybe you're not a morning person. And you, you say, I want to change things. I want to get up at 6 a.m. Well, get up at 6 a.m. 21 days in a row. And by the 22nd day, it's pretty much a routine for you. Okay, so three weeks is what it takes to establish a habit. One of my chief concerns about this whole thing is when you close the doors and people get into the habit of not coming to church, they may not ever get back into the habit of coming back to church again. That's a legitimate concern of mine. There are actually people that have not been to church since we closed for COVID the first time. And there's been a couple of people that aren't even responding to Telephone calls and text messages and emails. I'm concerned about people. I'm concerned about people disconnecting with the kingdom. People that are, that are not being spurred on. That's what happened. They, they, they were no longer connecting with people. They were no longer f fellowshipping. They weren't being spurred on anymore. And they lost all of their encouragement. They lost all of their drive, all of their zeal. I've heard uh, some pastors, they're saying, well, you know, if people don't come to church, then we're not going to have the offering money that we need to stay open. I'm not concerned about that. In fact, I'm going to be honest with everyone. Our church is actually in a better financial position right now than we've ever been since we started this church. Amen? Amen? Now, one of the reasons for that is We've got a great group of people that have continued to support our ministry financially even when the doors were closed. And another reason for that is we haven't had as many expenses in the last several months as we normally have. You know, right now we're not doing our Saturday night meal. And that's a big expenditure for us every single week. But right now we're actually in a better place financially than we were before COVID shut everything down. So I'm not concerned about the finances. I'm concerned about people. Amen. I'm concerned about people disconnecting with each other. People not being able to spur each other on and, and encourage each other. People falling away from the kingdom. What were the primary things that Jesus did in his ministry? He taught the kingdom. He healed the sick. He told the, the 12 disciples, teach the kingdom, heal the sick. 
He told the 72, teach the kingdom, heal the sick. How can we teach the kingdom if people aren't listening to what we're teaching? How can we teach the kingdom if people aren't connecting? If people aren't at least logging in online if, if they're not coming to church? He taught the kingdom and he healed the sick. How can we lay hands on the sick if I got to stay six feet away from you? My, my, my arms aren't six feet long. I mentioned this earlier, you know, California has outlawed singing in a church service. Yeah. Here's another thing. All it takes is one state to set a precedent and then other states feel free to follow. To stomp on people's re religious freedoms. We are faith, life, worship, worship center. You ain't never going to tell my church that we can't worship. You're never going to tell me that I can't sing, that I can't shout, that I can't raise my voice. You're not going to tell me that I can't praise, that I can't worship my God. We're in a season where the enemy is trying to silence the church. He's trying to shout louder than the church. We've got people that are storming churches and causing violence. The enemy wants to rob us of our ability to assemble, rob us of our ability to connect with each other, rob us of our money, rob us of our effectiveness. Rob us of our ability to spur each other on. In a world where governments are encouraging protests, numbering in the thousands, encouraging lawlessness, encouraging people to storm City Hall, shouting chants about defunding the police, shouting chants about racism, shouting chants about politics, but, but Christians can't assemble and sing unto the Lord our God? Don't tell me that there's not an anti-Christian agenda at work here. When people can badmouth Jesus, but they don't dare say a word against Muhammad or Buddha. When people will break out stained glass windows in a church, but they wouldn't dare deface a mosque. Don't tell me that the enemy isn't hard at work against the church. Matthew chapter 24. I want to show you something. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. Tell us, they said, when will this happen? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Jesus answered, watch out that no one deceives you. How much deception is going on in our society right now? For many will come in my name claiming I am the Messiah and will deceive many. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars. Anybody seen that lately? But see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All of these things are the beginning of birth pains. Then, he's talking to Christians. He's talking to you and me. Then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death. And you will be hated by who? All nations. All nations. Does that include the United States of America? Yeah. Unfortunately, yes, it does. And we're beginning to see the beginning of this. Of a nation that was built on Christian foundations. On a, a nation that was built on Judeo-Christian values. After 250 years of trying to govern by Judeo-Christian values... They're starting to turn away from those values and they're starting to hate the body of Christ. You will be hated by all nations, not just some. All nations are going to hate you because of me, because of Christ, because we are serving him, because we are serving his agenda. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Now watch this. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. 
This is what I'm concerned about right now. We have seen such an increase in wickedness in the last few months. And my concern is that Christians' hearts are going to grow cold. They're going to disconnect with the kingdom. They're going to disconnect with the body of Christ. I don't want to see that. As a pastor, I'm concerned about that. Verse 13. But the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. The one who doesn't give in. The one whose heart doesn't grow cold. The one who stays connected. The one who keeps spurring people on and allowing others to spur them on. They're not going to grow cold. They're going to stand firm. And they're going to be saved. Verse 14. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. That's the all nations that hate Jesus. That's the all nations that hate the body of Christ. That's the all nations that hate you because of him. This gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations and then the end will come. Yeah. Notice this does not say and salvation will be preached to the whole world. No. And uh, uh, the sinner's prayer will be prayed with the whole world. That's not what it says. It says the good news of God's government. The good news of how the kingdom works. The good news of how God operates. God's system of operation, his kingdom, his government, his way of doing things. This good news of the kingdom is going to be preached to the whole world. That's one of the reasons that I got so excited when our church had the opportunity to go on television preaching the gospel on two worldwide television networks. And I want to tell you something. We've only been uh, broadcasting in Africa for a couple of weeks. Africa loves us. They have, been, they have been reaching out on Facebook. They've been sending us emails. They've been uh, contacting us through the website. I had a guy uh, reach out to me this morning. He watched our Saturday morning uh, broadcast, which actually happens in the middle of the night for us because they're over in Africa. He watched our, uh, yeah, like 3 a.m. here, but it's 9 a.m. over there. He watched our uh, broadcast this morning. He emailed me. He said, I want you to know that I prayed the sinner's prayer with you when you uh, walked us through salvation on the broadcast. He says, will you pray for, for me because uh, I have an addiction to pornography? Yeah, we're going to pray for you. Yeah, we're going to reach out to you. Yeah, we're going to spur you on. Amen. One more thing that we're going to close. I want to go back to what I said in the beginning of the message where my friend uh, got attacked by the large woman who tried to steal her Paw Patrol car seat. <clears throat> and my other friend said that she should have turned the other cheek. Let's look at what the Bible has to say about that. Matthew chapter 5. <clears throat> Jesus is talking here. He says, But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. By the way, what he's talking about here is it was a common practice back then. They were under Roman rule. Roman soldiers would demand that people carry their gear for him. So if a Roman soldier comes up to you and says, carry my gear for a mile, Jesus says, carry it for two miles. Verse 42, give to the one who asks you and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. Now I taught this passage a year ago, almost a year ago this day. But I want to bring it up again. Uh, Jesus is not telling the church that we need to be a punching bag. He's not telling us that we need to let people walk all over us. What he's saying is, if the damage is already done, here's how I want you to react. If somebody took your shirt, give him your coat as well. Because if he just takes your shirt, then you're out of a shirt. 
But if you allow him to take the shirt and you give him your coat as well, you have gone from being a victim to being a person who just sowed a seed. You went from a person who something was stolen from you, but now you've turned it into, no, you didn't steal anything from me. I gave it to you. I sowed it into you. No, you didn't take one mile away from me. I gave you two miles. And when you do that, you, you have to do this by faith. It's a mindset. When you do this, you go from being a person who was stolen from to a person who has sown a seed. Yeah. And when you sow a seed, now you have a scriptural, biblical kingdom right to receive a harvest on the seed that you sowed. Yeah. And now instead of being bitter and being angry that somebody stole something from you, you can be happy and you can uh, anticipate and expect a great harvest on the seed that you sowed. So I, I taught this last year, and I don't know how many remember my aunt Dana, who uh, she owned a commercial property and somebody did $20,000 worth of damage to her property, and I shared with her this kingdom principle. She had a, a, a property that these people came in, they wanted to remodel the property, they did $20,000 worth of damage to the inside of the building, they also damaged the uh, parking lot and they hadn't paid their rent in months and then they left and my aunt was just livid about this she goes how in the world could they do this to me this is going to cost me twenty thousand dollars just to renovate the building and make it rentable again and I told her I said you're never going to get any money out of this person because if they could have paid you they would have they haven't paid rent they, they haven't finished the building. All they did was damage it, and then they left. I said, you're never going to get any money out of them. But what you can do is consider this a $20,000 seed that you sowed. And now that you have $20,000 worth of seed in the ground, you can expect a harvest on that. I said, I wouldn't be surprised if the phone doesn't start, start ringing off the hook with people bringing you business. They have a, an HVAC business. They do air conditioning. Two weeks later, she sent me a message. She goes, we have business. We have so much business right now, I have to hire somebody. And not only do I have to hire somebody, but I found out that there's a college in the area here that has a work-study program, and they're going to give me an employee for 13 weeks for free. And, uh, I mean, the phone was ringing off the, the hook. They were getting all sorts of business that they had never had before. And she was putting this principle, this scriptural principle, to work. Well, she called me about a month ago. And she said, when you get a chance, I want you to share this uh, uh, story with your church. She said, that $20,000 seed that I released them. She says, I, I released them from their obligation. I prayed for them. I said, Lord, I give this to you. I, I sow that seed and I release it in Jesus' name. And I receive a harvest on this. She said, we're still receiving uh, a harvest on uh, that seed that we sowed. She said, there's a uh, building in their area. It's an old building. It was built back in the 1800s. And they are renovating this building. And they called her husband and they said, we want you to do the HVAC for this building. It's a $275,000 job. She said, we are receiving the harvest on that $20,000 seed that we sowed. Amen? Amen? So look, folks, here's where we are. We're in a battle. It's a spiritual battle. We're not battling against people. All right? This is one of the reasons that I, I, I preached the message uh, right after we closed doors the first time for COVID. I, I preached a series uh, on spiritual warfare. Because we need to understand we're in a spiritual battle. We're not in a battle against people. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. We wrestle against the principalities and the powers that those people are upon of. But we are in a battle. Now you can make a choice. You can either cower back or you can step up. You can take your rightful position in the kingdom. You can allow the wickedness around you to cause your love to grow cold. Or you can make the choice to stoke the fire within you. 
And instead of growing cold, you grow hot. You can either disconnect with the body of Christ, or you can make the, de the decision that you're not going to allow the enemy to dictate your actions. You can either boldly lay hands on the sick and they'll recover, or you can live in fear. The righteous are as bold as a lion. That's what the Word of God says. We're not, we're not as timid as a mouse or timid as a rabbit. We're as bold as a lion. Say, so I'm as bold as a lion. You can either be promoted or you can be disqualified. It's totally up to you. I'd rather be promoted. You can allow the pandemic to cause you to step back or you can allow it to cause you to step up. What's it going to be? Amen? Throw your hands in the air and say this. I'm not going to grow cold. I'm going to stoke the fire. I'm not stepping back. I'm stepping forward. I'm not stepping down. I'm stepping up. I'm not giving in to fear. I'm living by faith. I'm not a thermometer. I'm a thermostat. I change the atmosphere around me. In Jesus' name, we're going forward. We're making a difference for the kingdom. We're a light in the darkness. And if you believe that, give God a shout for it tonight. Come on, we know who we are in Christ. Give God a shout. Roar like the lion that you are. The righteous are as bold as a lion. Amen? Amen. Amen. We need to encourage each other. We need to stoke the fire, stir ourselves up. We need to spur each other on. Amen? Amen. We need to stay connected. Reach out to people. Amen? Amen? I mean, as much as I like to reach out to people, I want to see the body of Christ doing this as well. When you don't see people in church, give them a call. Ask them how things are going. Keep, keep connecting with people. We need this now more than ever. We're in a society, in an environment right now where people need the body of Christ to be what we've been called to be. Can you say amen? amen. Hi, I'm Heath. And I'm Louise. And we want to thank you so much for watching this video. Faith Life Worship Center in Naples, Florida is a Bible-believing, spirit-filled, non-denominational church. If you live in Southwest Florida and you're looking for a good church with a fun and energetic contemporary worship experience, awesome children and youth ministries, and a great family atmosphere, we'd love to see you at one of our services really soon. Go to faithlifeworshipcenter.com to learn more about our church, watch other messages online, check out our store, or support our ministry financially. Please take a few seconds to like this video and subscribe to our channel. You can also find us on social media. We hope that you'll watch other messages online, but what we really want is to see you in person at Faith Life Worship Center. Hope to see you soon. Bye. Bye.